Hello everybody and welcome back. Well as you can see I have been a little bit busy here and I have been working on the preamp and phase inverter section. Now you have to kind of build these two together to test them and the reason for that is because they the phase inverter section gets derives its voltage from the preamp section on the grid so in other in other words in order to get the correct grid voltage you have to have the preamp section connected and we'll look at that here open this up a little bit so you can see over here what i'm talking about if you notice you have this last section of the power supply it goes through this 82k anode resistor which is bypassed by this little network here and it goes into the anode of this pentode tube which is your this is your gain stage for the amplifier for the most part and tied directly to the anode you have the grid of the phase inverter so if you didn't have that voltage here this would not be correct now I wired this up and I powered it up and just as I expected it did not work properly it works but not perfectly and there's a reason it comes back to this unregulated power supply now there's a difference between <laughs> a filtered power supply and a regulated power supply I think sometimes people get a little confused with those terms but this power supply will vary based upon the load that you put on it and each section will do that so you have a resistor whenever you change the load on the on this side of this resistor you're changing the divider between this resistor what it's going to dissipate and whatever the load is going to dissipate so essentially what you're going to get is a voltage drop so if the whole amp isn't completely built and completely powered up as one unit you're never going to have perfect voltages so even the things that we saw in this output section when we tested it while it did work it's not at its optimal operating point because all of the other parts of the amplifier are not loading down the circuit yet so you have to keep that in mind so what we're really interested in we're going to test this and I'm, I'm going to go over some voltages with you and then we're going to see how building the other section is going to affect it we're also going to see how with the voltages being a little bit out how it's going to affect the signal that we put through it now another thing I want to mention because it, it, I probably will bring this up at another time in more detail but in case I forget I want to mention this I got a couple of emails uh, from some of my patrons and I got some comments and this is not just in this series this was on some other amplifier videos that I did in the past with vacuum tubes and what I heard was what I'm getting and it's it's a pretty common question so I'm gonna I'm going to answer it and that is I got one of these kit amplifiers or I rebuilt an amplifier when I turned it on I got this horrid sounding screech it was really loud on the speakers and I had to turn it off most of the time what causes that problem is the way you have the output transformer wired we're gonna look at that what it's like if you have them backwards believe it or not I actually marked these incorrectly the blue and the yellow wire should be swapped around on this. The yellow is the top winding and the blue is the bottom winding. So when I looked at it on the transformer, I got that wrong. And of course, you could put a signal into there and look at the phase relationship at the output to, to determine that. But I did not do that when we tested the transformer. So anyway, if these two leads get swapped around, the yellow and the blue here, what's going to happen is as soon as you connect it's going to work okay if you don't have the feedback loop connected so if this negative feedback loop is disconnected you'll probably get some sound out of it and it'll work of course it won't be linear it'll have distortion all that because you don't have the it's running open loop but it won't go into crazy oscillation it might but not real bad 
if you swap these two leads around, then what's going to happen is the phase relationship of this is going to be 180 degrees out of phase from here and what's going to or it's going to be in phase with here and what's going to happen is instead of sending an opposite signal to cancel out uh, signals it's going to actually add to it so this is going to become a positive feedback loop and what do you have when you put a positive feedback loop in an amplifier you have an oscillator <laughs> and you're hearing the sound of the amplifier being an oscillator and all you need to do to fix that problem is swap these two wires around. So if you build an amplifier kit or something and it screeches terribly and you think that you completely ruined the amplifier and it's all wrong, chances are it's not wrong. All you did was put these two wires in backwards. And all you have to do is swap them around. And I'll put a, I have the other set I have backwards. We're going to leave them backwards and we're going to wire the other channel up. We're going to just see what that does to the amplifier. We'll monitor it on the scope. Now, what we're going to do first thing is we're just going to feed a signal into this input. And by the way, I have this pot wired backwards. I'm going to have to flip it around on its little... It has a little tiny circuit board to mount the pot on. It's pretty convenient, but I put it on the wrong side of the board. It's not really marked on this silk screen which side you're supposed to mount it on. So that's an easy fix, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. But we're going to feed a sine wave in here and see what we get out at the speaker terminals across an 8 ohm load. And then we're going to monitor this phase inverter. What is the purpose of this? So because this is a push-pull amplifier, what that means is when these are both sitting at idle, they're both conducting current in equal and opposite directions with respect to this transformer. And what has to happen in order for this to work properly, if I drive this one positive, this signal positive, I have to equal and opposite drive this grid negative. And vice versa, if I drive this grid negative, then I have to drive this grid equal and opposite positive. And that's what gives you that push-pull. That's what causes both of these to work in unison so that you have an equal change in magnetic field across this core, which is going to translate to the sound coming out of your secondary. If you had them both driving equally, so let's say we tied these two grids together and drove them with an equal circuit, which is with one signal, I'm sorry, with one equal signal, you would never see anything come out of here because these would both turn on more <laughs> and they would turn off more, but they would always be balanced. And because they're always balanced, you would never get a changing magnetic field. So it would never transfer over to the secondary. So you would not have any magnetic coupling, uh, at least from an AC standpoint. So as a result, you have to have an inverted signal between these two. And if you recall, the signal that we put into our amplifier is just a single signal. There's only one signal, and it's one polarity. So we have to have that signal pass through to one side, and then we have to have an inverted version of it passing through the other side. And that's what the job of this phase inverter, we get a clue from the name, what this does. Basic vacuum tube 101. When you bias this tube, it'll sit at a certain voltage at the anode and at the cathode and as we apply a grid a voltage signal to the grid then it's going to either turn depending on which positive or negative going voltage I apply to this it's going to either turn this tube on more or turn it off so it's going to raise so if I raise the voltage if I go more positive on the grid this on the anode because the tube is conducting harder it's turning on harder this is going to drop your anode voltage will go down and your cathode voltage will go up because the tube is conducting more so now you'll have more voltage down here and less voltage up here so what happens is as this voltage is going down 
this voltage is going up. And then conversely, if I put, if I drive this grid more negative in voltage, then it will turn this tube off more, which will cause a higher voltage to be up here and a lower voltage to be down here. So essentially, think of this circuit as an old fashioned inverter circuit or like an op amp kind of. What's going to happen is you're going to have an inverting and a non inverting output. So what's going to happen is this signal is always going to be inverted from this one and this signal is always going to follow this one. And that's how it's going to work. So the purpose of this tube is not to amplify the signal but to provide the proper polarity of signals to our push-pull output. That's the purpose of this. That's why it's here. This is our voltage amplifier. And the purpose of this is to take a small signal that's coming in to your amplifier and increase the amplitude of that signal to a high enough level that when we drive the rest of this circuit, because the rest of the circuit doesn't have much gain in it. This, believe it or not, these output tubes don't, their job is not to produce a whole bunch of gain, but rather to be able to provide the extra current that you're going to have when you put a load on here. So it has to be able to deliver the proper current to this impedance so that when this, when the voltage starts going up on this, this is a low impedance circuit, it's going to draw heavy current and that's going to fold over to here and cause this to draw heavier current and you have to have these large tubes, these output tubes, to be able to handle that extra current. If you try to just connect it directly to here, you know, like with just a triode tube, and this, this little tiny tube would never be able to handle that kind of current at those voltages. So this boosts the voltage, this splits the, the phase, and these allow us to handle the current. And that's really the crux of how <laughs> an audio amplifier works. Now prior to this we can put tone control sections, we can put a phono stage because uh, phono cartridges have much lower output than a line level like your you know like a CD player or an MP3 player those have higher outputs of you know 500 millivolts to up to one volt or so whereas phono cartridges have just millivolts okay of signal so what ends up happening is you have to really boost that up to line level so you're gonna have another stage of amplification that's gonna work similar to this and then you're probably going to have a buffer section which is you're gonna have two triode tubes that are not really amplifying but they're just isolating or matching the impedance from this stage to, to the input stage so that you can use your tone controls so all those things don't exist in this. This is a very basic amplifier and you really are supposed to plug a preamp into it. And that's the purpose of the preamp is to switch the different inputs, you know, to select different inputs, to add that extra uh, stage for the phono and to add tone control. And so that would be your preamp. But this does have enough gain that if you just plugged your cell phone or your MP3 player right into it, you would get enough gain to drive this amp into its full power. So it's kind of a little bit of a trade-off there. But anyway, that's the way this thing works. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to kind of measure some of these voltages and look at what what the signals path looks like going through it. Okay, so we have an 8 ohm dummy load connected. We have the amp turned on and warmed up. And I'm just putting a 400 hertz sine wave into it from the little handheld uh, signal generator. And let's turn the volume up. We can see, not bad. Not bad at all, but you can see it, there's some asymmetrical clipping, and as you look at the bottom, you can see that there is some oscillation taking place, and I'll show you where that's coming from. But actually, the asymmetrical clip, clipping is not horrible. 
and you can see right about at that clip point we're getting about nine volts look at the lower left hand corner it says RMS so if we do nine volts right nine volts times squared right that's going to be 81 divided by 8 ohms that's about 10 10 and a quarter watts if you can see that <laughs> or 10, 10 and 1 8 watts so it's just a little bit over 10 watts and we can get rid of that noise but we may have to play with it a little bit but considering we don't have all the amplifier uh, wired up yet or anything that's pretty darn close and uh, let's just see how close our voltages are I have a feeling some of them are going to be off a little bit and uh, we'll measure those down here let me get resituated okay we are going to start by looking at pin one of our phase inverter and it says in the schematic that there should be about 172 volts but I bet you that's going to be high because you should have the other channel in parallel and if you notice they're both both channels are being fed off of this one resistor so you're gonna have half the load that you should have here so my guess is this is gonna be off and if you look there it is we're on pin one and we're off it's 200 volts all right now let's look at pin 8 and see what we're getting there which is the cathode of the phase inverter all right the schematic says that we need about 95 volts there and we're not too far off you can see we're about 96 97 volts it's kind of floating around a little bit so we're off by about a, a volt and a half one volt something like that and that'll drift around a little bit now let's look at what is on the grid now the grid should be a lower voltage than this with respect to ground so if this is 95 volts I would expect this to be less than 95 volts let's see if it is and you can see it's about 93 volts so there's about a it's a it's sitting at about negative two volts with respect to the cathode so if I want if I'm measuring with respect to ground right now if I took that ground probe and I put it right on the cathode which is pin 8 so if I put the meter from here to here I should see about minus two volts if the negative probe is on the cathode let's try that and of course once again we have about minus 2.3 volts so the grid is sitting negative uh, with respect to the uh, to the cathode and of course you typically want it like that there are instances where you're putting a positive voltage on the grid but that's going to cause the grid to draw current and you don't want current on the grid typically so you want to keep that minus now that doesn't mean that this will not drive positive it could drive into the positive range but it's not going to sit idle in the positive range so we'll look at all that here in a minute uh, when we put this up on the oscilloscope and put a signal through it and of course because the grid of the phase inverter is connected to the anode of the voltage amplifier see they're tied together this should also be about 95 volts or whatever 93 whatever we were reading there and of course it is 92.6 so it's the same voltage because it's tied to the same point what a mess huh so we now have our differential probes and you can see them back here connected to two channels of our scope and we have the channel one still connected to the output and so essentially what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the output over here at the speaker and we are going to look right here and right here on the phase inverter section okay okay how about that for a mess 
So I have my differential probes connected to the anode and cathode of the phase inverter, which, you know, right here. So pins one and pin eight. And I'm still looking with the with channel one on the scope. So that's channel three and four. And on channel one, we're looking at the output across the dummy load, eight ohm dummy load resistor. So the yellow trace will be the speaker or the dummy load. The purple trace will be the anode. And the green trace will be the cathode side of the phase inverter. And we should see the out of phase signals. All right, let me get this thing going here. Okay, we're warmed up and turn the volume up and you can see the purple trace, which is the anode side, is clipped off at one end, but the green trace, which is the cathode follower, has the full sine wave on it. And you can see if we push too hard, the two out of phase signals oscillate. And the reason they're both oscillating together is because that oscillation is taking place not in that tube, but in the, pr the prior stage, which is over here on the voltage amplifier stage. And you can see those two capacitors there. More than likely, there's a problem with that, and that's what's causing that oscillation. But other than that, even at, you know when we drive it at a reasonable signal, you can see we get a really nice clean, that yellow trace is would, would be going to your speaker, and the green trace and the purple trace are your two out of phase signals. This is pretty much what it's going to look like. We may have a little bit of problem with bias, and that is because, we, if you remember, we were getting that, hundred and nine, that 200 volts where we should have been getting 172. So I'm not going to touch anything in this design because I think when we get the other stage built, this is all going to straighten out. Or I mean when I get the other channel built, not the other stage. When I get the left channel built. Alrighty. So I have the other channel built now, as you can see. And no, I did not do a solder and talk on this one because I, this, there's enough content in this as it is. And you saw me do that on the other channel, so it's all good. Anyway, we're going to see what this thing does when we power it up. I've now moved the dummy load over here over to this channel. And we're back on the scope. Okay, let's power up and see what it does. Oh no, what's happening? <laughs> so right there is an example of what it will do if you swap the two plate leads or the two anode leads on your output transformer. So you can see I have these two in the correct orientation, but this channel, you can see the yellow and the blue wires are swapped. Let's switch them back around and see what happens to that oscillation. Okay, so we've swapped the yellow and blue wires around. Let's turn power on, see what happens. And how about that? No oscillation. Quiet as a church mouse. All right, let's put some signal in it. Okay, amplifiers turned on, signal generator connected, left channel. And look at that. And right about the same place it starts to break up, right around nine volts. And you get that tiny little bit of oscillating on that one side, so that's probably a trade-off that they did, or it could be the just that particular value of capacitor was what they had, but they really needed a little bit bigger one. I think that uh, 100 picofarad probably should be closer to a uh, 150 or 120 picofarad, and that would probably 
get rid of all of that. All right, now that we have both channels built, let's see how this uh, affected our voltages. And mainly what we're looking at is we're looking at anode voltage and cathode voltage of the phase splitter and the grid voltage of the phase splitter and anode voltage of the voltage amplifier. So what we're really looking for, these are all going to be a little high because our mains voltage is high. So we have to take that into account. But this, this should be somewhere in the 180 volt range, you know, 180, 185, something like that. This should probably be somewhere around 97 volts or so. And this is probably going to have to be somewhere in the low 90s, like 91 to 93 volts, somewhere like that, because it's going to be a little high as well. So let's see if all of this is correct, where we end up. First thing we're going to look at is pin 1, which is our 172. We should see somewhere around 180 volts. And you can see it is, it's still real high. Tubes are still warming up, but you're still, 100, you're still about 10 volts high. 5 to 10 volts high, I would say. About 10 volts high. Let's look at the grid of, of the triode section and the anode of the pentode section. That's right here. And that's real low. That should be much higher than that. I mean, even, in the, even under the correct conditions, it should be 88 volts. So that's too low. And that's going to tell me that the other one right here, yeah, that's way low. So we are going to have to change a resistor in here, I think, to get it perfect. So let me shut this off for the moment. Let's just make sure that both channels are doing the same thing. So here is, again, the anode of the phase inverter. And same thing, same voltage. Here is the grid and anode, same voltage. And here is the cathode of the phase inverter, same voltage. So same problem in both of them. So what I'm going to do is I am going to change this. Uh, voltage. What I want to do first is I'm just going to jumper a resistor across here to lower this a little bit, to raise this a little bit. And we're going to see if that makes a difference. Okay, all I have done is I've taken a couple of test hooks and I've shunted a 390K, I'm taking a guess at this, 390K resistor in parallel with this 82K. And hopefully, uh, we'll see where this gets us. It should be close. Um, like I said, I just kind of did a rough guess of where I think it should be. So let's turn the power on. Let it warm up. Now let's see what we get. Oh, that's better already. Okay, and it in the on the schematic it's calling for 172, but remember our mains voltage is higher, so I would expect that. So let's look at the other side, the cathode of the phase inverter, and it's a little higher than 95. So that's perfect. So I bet if we look at our oh yeah, so we have 95 on the grid. 97.5, that's perfect. I think that's what we need. So all we need to do now is measure the resistance with that 390K across there, and that should give us an idea of what, what resistor we need. Okay, I have everything turned off and unplugged, and I used the little stinger cable to make sure everything was properly discharged. Even though we have a bleeder resistor on here, we still want to be sure. And now I have it set to ohms, and I have one side here, and I have the other side going to go across here. And according to this, 
48K. So a 68K resistor should be should just about do it. So what we're going to do, in case you're not following me here, where's my pencil? Do I have a pencil? Yes, I do. So we are going to take this resistor and we're going to change it from an 82K to a 68K. And that's going to mess around with this network here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower this as well to a 27K. And I'm still going to stick with this 100 picofarad. I think that's still going to be okay. And I may switch that out, um, I don't know, from a ceramic. Well, it's still, it should be okay. If I have a mica one, maybe I'll use that. Who knows? Anyway, that's what we're going to do. Okay, I found some real nice 68K resistors. And I didn't have a 27K, but I had some 24Ks. And I had these 100 uh, picofarad mica capacitors. And as you can see, I've already fitted the first one in there. Down there, you can see it. Amplifiers powered up. And we have a signal going in, as you can see. Let's see what kind of an improvement we've made. All right, here we go. How about that? And very slightly asymmetrical clipping, but not bad. And look at that. The, that oscillation is gone. You can see we're getting slightly less power now not really it's clipping at about again it's clipping right around 10 watts and this is a 10 watt amplifier this is what I would expect from it but right there at 8.2 volts RMS it's running all day long so I think this is going to be a good sounding amp let's do the other channel okay there it is all assembled and uh, we'll take one last look here at the chassis before we uh, put the bottom on it. And this thing's going to be ready to test out. I think it turned out okay. Voltages are all good. Um, I tested this channel off camera after putting the new resistor and network on. Both channels are now almost dead on at 10 watts per channel maximum before they start to clip. They clip pretty much asymmetrically. Any tiny little bit of asymmetry there is, is probably because the, the output tubes are not perfectly matched, but they're really close, close enough based on the design. I think if we were running this amp really hot and uh, kind of running it towards its maximum uh, ratings of the tubes and everything, we may see a little more uh, asymmetric clipping. But since they were very conservative with the design, we don't have that problem. So this amp is going to stay really solid and uh, I think it's going to sound great. So let's put it all together and uh, start testing. Okay, we have our little amplifier connected up to the dummy load, and we have it connected up to our frequency analysis setup. And you can see right here. So let's run our frequency analysis. You can see up here the waveforms, how they're a little bit out of phase, and that's to be expected on this amp, I would say. A lot of capacitors going on in here, you know. And we have some bass roll off, I can see already, but let's let it finish up. Okay. So you can see from about 40 hertz, 50, about 50 hertz or so, all the way out to 20 kilohertz, it's relatively flat. But from there down to 20, there's quite a bit of roll off. And that's on purpose, I believe. Uh, the reason that these little amplifiers have such a roll off at the lower base is to allow the amplifier to have a louder perceived volume when you listen to it, when you crank it up without distorting. If it's reproducing the bass <laughs> like it should, 
what's going to happen is the amplifier is going to pretty much rail out. You're going to it'll start clipping uh, at a lower volume level. The amp will sound clearer and more balanced, especially in the low end, but you'll have less perceived volume to your ears, I'll say. So really, what you would ask yourself at this point is, would you rather be able to play the amplifier louder, or would you rather have a lower volume amplifier uh, and have it have a flatter response? And that's really what it is. Now, you can, of course, crank the bass up in your device, in your preamp, or in your, you know, if you're hooking up your your cell phone, mobile device, or whatever, you could turn up the bass that way. Or we could make this thing be flat. And the way we could do that is by adjusting that negative feedback. So let's take a look at that here. So if you notice, we have this line coming off of the, the positive lead of our speaker terminal. It feeds through a, just a simple, simple little 10K resistor, and it feeds into the cathode of our voltage amplifier stage. And what that does is, just as the name implies, it's negative feedback, so it's going to subtract whatever signal comes through it from here. So, in theory, anything that is different from here that comes to here is going to be considered distortion, and it's going to cancel that out. But also, it can make the amplifier more linear, depending on how uh, you set this up. So what can we do? Well, one thing we could do is we could reduce this 10K resistor and move it to something like maybe a 8.2K or 7.5K or something like that. So what I've done is I've basically cut this in half. I changed this 10K to a 4.7K. And you say, what an incredible amount of feedback that's going to be. Well, think about it this way. If you look from here to here, pin 7 goes through a 200 ohm resistor. So you have a 200 ohm DC resistance. And that's going to be, since it's a resistor, it doesn't matter about uh, what frequency it is. And if you look here, essentially what you're doing is you're taking this 10K resistor in, in series with this the DC resistance of this coil which is probably going to be somewhere around you know 3 ohms 4 ohms something like that this 8 ohm tap it's only a couple of ohms so for all intents and purposes you're putting a 10k resistor in parallel with this 200 ohm resistor and of course you are going to have the reactance of the speaker and the coil here that'll change the value of this a little bit uh, you know with respect to frequency. For the most part, that's going to be in parallel with this. So by putting a 10K in parallel with 200 ohms versus 4.7K 4 in parallel with 200 ohms, it's not an enormous difference uh, in what you're going to see here for feedback. So I change those out and you can see the little, maybe you can see them, the little 4.7Ks right here and here. And when we look up at the Bode plot with our frequency analysis, look how flat that is. And you can see now, maybe you can see, that using the little cursors here, you're only 3.48 or 3.5 dB down at 20 hertz uh, than you are from where we're linear very very little so this is going to make a big difference in the low frequency uh, response of this amp when we play it so let's put it back together and we'll play another song and there's the top with the thing with the bottom put on and everything else now my assessment of this as a kit well first of all if you're new to the kit building thing or to electronics I would not recommend this there are a lot of things in here that, since there's no instructions, that they don't tell you. And if you don't have experience with amplifiers in general, how they work, or with kit building, it can be very confusing. Now, the last 6BQ5 or uh, 6P14 push-pull amplifier kit that I built, 
It had a little bit more information that came with it, but even that I noticed a lot of people that went ahead and ordered one after watching the video that I did, they reported that having a lot of problems. The transformers they got were different each time. <laughs> you know, it seems like everybody that ordered one of them got different transformers and the wire colors were wrong and things like that. It was very confusing. Uh, they give you a bunch of parts in a box. That's why I called this the J-Bop amp, <laughs> J-A-B-O-P, just a box of parts. And that's exactly what you get with a folded up schematic that I really had to scan this on my scanner and clean it up to even be able to read it properly. Uh, so this is not for the faint of heart, even though it's a simple amplifier. And I will say if you build it on the circuit board, that would make things easier because obviously you just place the components on the board and solder them on and then screw it down to the holes. Another thing I noticed with this is some of the pilot holes for the RCA jacks especially and somewhat for the speaker terminals, they were drilled too big. So the terminals were very loose, how they fit in there. I think what they did was they drilled the pilot holes and then uh, just put whatever types of connectors they had on hand at the time in the, in the kit. So th little things like that can be sources of annoyment. <laughs> or of annoyance and just be aware that if you're going to build a kit like this that's what you're going to run into. Now as I said at the very beginning of all this uh, the purpose of me building this was not to show you how to build this kit or to show you where how to buy this kit or whatever. Uh, they're available online. The price isn't very bad for the kit but the shipping is horrific uh, especially with the things going on today you can pay almost as much for the shipping as you will for the kit itself. So it's, this is not worth it to me uh, for how much you're going to pay. But I wanted to do this to show you all how these amps go together. And this was a simple enough design that we could go just like we did step by step from each section and break it down to see how they work. You know, how an amplifier works. Even the high-end amps are going to work on the principles that we talked about in this video. So once you learn the basics of how these work, you can work on other amplifiers, especially when it comes to servicing them. Now when you look at a schematic, hopefully you can refer back to these videos and have an idea of what's supposed to be going on. Of course, as I said many times in this series, I'm not a professional in this. Uh, there are many people out there who are much better than I am. But uh, I just shared with you what I had because I really haven't seen much of anything like this on the internet anywhere. And I wanted to get at least something up there for all of you who are getting into this hobby. Because I think electronics is a, is a pretty awesome thing to do. I enjoy it. I've loved it my whole life. And uh, I just enjoy sharing it with others. And I know that a lot of you can uh, find a lot of fun and a lot of joy in making these things too. So that's the cool thing of the internet. There's so many bad things going on in the internet these days that it's, I just like being able to do something good once in a while. So anyway, that's it. Uh, these holes that I punched for these two capacitors in the back, they were not punched in here. I had to put them in there with a, a set of uh, knockout punches. And the way you would mount these uh, with the kit, even though that doesn't tell you that, they gave you a couple of these uh, standoff mounting pads. You, you just peel the sticky off, you put it down on the chassis and then you zip tie the capacitor to it and that's how they have you mount it. It's kind of janky how they do it. I like mounting the capacitors on the top like this. Keeps them away from all the heat and everything and get, you know, look at how much real estate that would take up underneath the amplifier. So. I thought it would be a better idea to do it this way. I had some of these little mounting rings and you can get these on Mauser, DigiKey, every, everywhere uh, for capacitors. You just measure the diameter of the cap you have and look it up. They're only a couple dollars so they're not expensive. And again, these transformers would work with any number of tubes. You could, as I said, you could use 6AQ5s. Probably 6BQ5s would work on here, or EL84s, uh, 6V6, uh, you know, the EL90s, of course, which is the same thing as a, as a 6AQ5. All of those would work. 
and with just some minor adjustments to the circuitry. Just remember the sockets, with, with the exception of the 6BQ5, the sockets are going to be different. They'll probably be either the little 7-pin mini sockets, or, or for the 6V6, they'll be the 8-pin octal sockets that are larger. So you would have to modify the mounting for these somehow. You either have to make a little adapter ring or something, uh, or drill it out bigger if you're using the 6V6s, whatever. But you can do that. It would work. I mean, you could pretty much keep all the component values the same, and it would most likely work. So we come to the end of another journey, and I know no matter how long and how many videos I put out on this, there's always going to be questions because there's just so much to learn about all this stuff. So, you know, I try to answer the comments uh, as I can, but I can't always have time to do it. I'm very busy with work and things, but I do try to keep up with them. If you do have questions about amplifiers or these designs or anything like that, or comments that would help us all out, myself included, please feel free down in the comments section to, to uh, comment. And I appreciate all of my patrons out there. And what, as I said in the beginning, I'm going to give this amplifier to one of my patrons. I'm not sure who yet, but I'm going to give it away. I don't really need this. I have so much stuff that I don't need. and. I would rather it be making music and, and somebody being able to get some enjoyment out of it than just sitting on a shelf <laughs> in my place. So this is going to go to someone else that uh, hopefully will appreciate it. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but as you heard, it really performs and we're going to, at the end of this video, we're going to do some testing on it. So I ratchet jawed enough here. Let's do our tests and then we're going to end it. Okay, looking at the specs for this tube, the closest thing we have is going to be the 6AQ5 because we don't have a good data sheet for the 6P1. And it says that within its maximum ratings, the performance of this type equivalent is to that of larger type 6V6 and 6V6 GTA. 6AQ5 does not show a push-pull design. They only show just a single-ended class A amplifier. So if we go over here to the 6V6, we do have a push-pull amplifier. And we look at some of the ratings here. And for instance, if we have 285 volts on the plate using an 8K transformer, because you have effective load resistance plate to plate, 8 kilo ohms. Our harmonic distortion is going to be 3.5 percent. And as you go lower power with higher plate-to-plate uh, -plate load resistance, the distortion gets worse. So I don't expect this to be the greatest performer on earth with distortion, but we do have some test equipment set up. We have our one kilohertz sine wave being fed into the amplifier. We're going into the dummy load and we have our 5054 set up here. There, I shut off some lights to make it a little easier to see. And our power meter just goes here and then goes up. And it's 10 watts per division. So as these two lines, the orange and purple lines go up, for each graticule, that's 10 watts of power, and for each little graticule, that's 2 watts of power. So if we run this up, I mean, the sine wave looks pretty clean. It doesn't look too bad. And you can see there's 6 watts, 8 watts, right around 10, you can see it's just starting to clip off at the bottom there. And then if you go a little above that, the top clips off. So we don't have perfect symmetrical clipping, but not bad. Now if we run this right about, let's say, 8 watts, that looks pretty good. Okay, looking at this now on the slow scan 
spectrum analyzer, I think we still have a problem we're going to have to address. I thought this thing was a wrap, but it's not. It sounds good, but I think it could sound better. Let's turn the volume up. I'm going to run this at about 6 watts right now. Let's go up to the slow scan uh, spectrum analyzer here. I'll zero you in, zoom you in, I should say. It's kind of tough with this camera mount to move it around. Okay, so let's reset it. And this scans very slowly. This is what it's supposed to do, but if I shut the light out here, you can see the second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. So there's a lot of distortion in here, especially with the second harmonic. Um, there's your fundamental. And I believe I know why it's doing this. Yes, these vacuum tubes will have some level of distortion uh, if you compare them to a solid state amplifier, but it should not be this bad. I think I know what it is. Okay, this actually worked out better than I thought it would. And for that, I'm getting out the lightsaber chopstick in blue. <laughs> so here's the thing. This 300K resistor controls the voltage on your screen grid. And this screen grid, really, what, it, what it's going to have the biggest influence in this particular circuit, the way it's configured, is by changing this value here, this is going to change how much this tube is going to conduct with respect to the grid. So what that means is that if this voltage is low, then you're going to need a pretty wide swing of voltage, or I'm sorry, uh, not a very wide swing of voltage for this to go to its maximum rail to rail. Whereas if you decrease this and this increases the voltage, then that's going to make this more less sensitive. Do I have that backwards? <laughs> anyway, it's going to change the operating point or the 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 bandwidth or the the swing of this grid, you know, with input signal versus output signal, and it does not do it in a totally linear fashion. So, long story short, this is actually good where it is right now. So what I did was I went through, checked my voltages again, and what I did was I changed this 200 ohm resistor to a 300 ohm resistor. So I raised this voltage up because we weren't quite getting our 0.42 volts right here. These were all kind of balancing out as we saw, but this wasn't, and that's what was causing our distortion to come in so early. So what we did was we changed the operating point of this by increasing this to 300 ohms. That raised this up even a little bit higher than our 0.42 volts. It's, it's right now sitting closer to 0.5 volts, it's almost half a volt. And here's the results. Now remember, when we were at 8 watts, we were probably getting 2 to 2 point, about 2% 2 uh, total harmonic distortion. Let's turn the amp on now, let's plug it in, turn it on, and let's see what kind of improvement we got. So the first thing we'll do is we'll let it warm up for a second. And of course, in a perfect world, we would let this stabilize and warm up and everything before we do these tests, but this will give us a rough idea of where we are. So we go up, and you can see it looks really nice and both channels are pretty close. You can see the one starts to clip a little bit before the other, but they're pretty close. And right, let's put this at eight watts per channel. So that's eight watts. And look at our distortion now. Yep, 0.24% down from over 2% huge difference and I did do a little bit of experimenting with the, with these values on this uh, cathode resistor uh, if I go to a 270 ohm the distortion goes a little bit higher 
And if I go to a 330 ohm, the distortion goes a little bit higher. But if I go right at 300 ohms, uh, that seems to be the sweet spot. Everything is happy. Now, and the other thing is, leaving this on, if I can find my wires for my meter here. I don't know if we're going to be able to see this here. Turn the volume down. And again, if we look at our pins, uh, now that's going to be the anode of the pentode section, and it's also going to be the grid of your phase inverter. This is the cathode of the pentode end, and you can see it's, you don't see anything, do you? <laughs> Let's go back here. All right. Let's try this one more once. So here is the anode of the pentode section and the grid of the phase inverter. Here is the uh, this would be the pin seven, which or uh, I'm sorry, pin eight, which is going to be the cathode of the phase inverter. And here is the anode of the K of the phase inverter very close to where we want it and then if we look at the cathode of the pentode section where we put that 300 ohm resistor we're now sitting at about 50 milliamp millivolts instead of 42 it was prior to that it was only about 30 something so you could see all our voltages are right where they need to be now so it took a little bit of finagling <laughs> to get the numbers where we want them and you have to remember the main reason I think this was originally designed the way it was was to cut down on the base response a little bit to roll it off so that you could get more perceived volume at the expense of having base roll off. By flattening that out we kind of shifted some things. Remember when you work with these kinds of amplifiers the power supply will drift <laughs> with the uh, you know, with ant with the uh, current draw with load, because this is a non-regulated power supply, so everything kind of has to work together, and that's where your calculations don't always add up perfectly. When you try to calculate load lines and things, you're calculating against a moving target. The power supply is drifting because you have these big resist dropping resistors to drop your voltages. And what that means is as the load changes with signal and so forth, the voltages are changing here. And you change the voltage here, the tiniest little bit, this whole operating curve goes crazy. So everything has to be perfectly balanced. So by changing this to a 300 ohm, it got us right where we want it. We have our 68K here, our 27K here, and we changed this to the 4.7K. And I'll make those changes on a schematic. I'll put it up on the screen. Okay, the amplifier's powered up here. I know there was a lot of discussion on these videos about people getting really hung up on these filament windings and should I use DC on the filaments and I didn't float them up off the chassis and I didn't put them here or there or anywhere the right place. So amplifier is on. Here is my speaker that we're connected to. I will take my microphone off. I will put it directly against the speakers. Do you hear any hiss or hum or anything of any sort? Okay. Yeah, it can be done. It's all about circuit layout. Okay, let's cue up some of our wonderful YouTube safe music. Wow. I don't know if you could tell a difference through a lapel microphone. I mean, it's, you know, and the YouTube algorithm and all this crap, but 
that little change made a big difference in the sound. I mean, it sounded good before actually, <laughs> but now that I hear it with this, it sounds even better. And the reason it does, it took a little bit of the harshness and the edge off of the high frequency sounds. So it, it, it kind of balanced it out and smoothed it. The, the cymbals sound more crisp. They don't have sibilance to them. Uh, it made, a, it made a big difference, I'm surprised, just changing those cathode resistors. And we can get all the volume we need now. I mean, it'll get loud. <laughs> and uh, I think we got it. So this time we are really done. We were able to verify with the uh, distortion meter that the distortion now at maximum power is right around less than half a percent about 0.3 percent for a vacuum tube amplifier like this that doesn't have an ultra linear output or anything like that using a pentode front end that's pretty good I think uh, considering all things not using match tubes or anything I'm more than happy with that and uh, it's loud, it sounds really clear, and it's, it's actually a pleasant amp to listen to, and I don't think it's gonna be fatiguing on the ears. So, there it is. So it comes to an end, the end of this long series on building an amplifier, and uh, you know, I learned a lot. I hope you learned some things too. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, well, I'm going to get back to some solid state projects, I think. I have several other vacuum tube projects. One for a good friend of mine that I really need to do, but I'm probably going to do some uh, solid state projects first. And I promise that I will get to his next. It'll be an interesting little thing too. But until then, as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And uh, thanks for watching and coming along, and thanks for all the good comments. And I wish you all well until next time. Take care. Bye-bye.